2022 meeting of the Town of Southampton Conservation Board. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with chapter one of the laws of 2022, until at least January, uh, at least February 9th, 2022, all of the board's meetings are expected to be held remotely via video conference. So we ask the public to continually check the town's website for updates and new information. As a reminder, applicants, agents, and members of the public who speak at this meeting should state their name and address for the record. The link to participate in this meeting via Zoom can be found on the town's website at the town clerk's meeting portal. If you do not wish to speak at the meeting, but you would like to submit comments for the public record, the link to submit comments can also be found on the town's website. <clears throat> Please join together for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for all. Okay, we'll begin the meeting with the acceptance of the January 12th, 2022 minutes as written and or amended. George is here. Is there a motion on the minutes? Move to move. To accept the minutes. Second. All in favor, Harry, aye. Ann? Aye. Tom, R. Um, F. Hi. And George, you missed the last meeting, so. I'm recusing. For the minutes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, public hearings A021035, Eugenio Presta. And the applicant requests an adjournment to March 9th. Charles, is there anyone in the audience with their hands up to speak? Yes. One moment. Frank is coming in now. You can speak. But yes, I'm, I'm waiting to speak on a specific application, uh, 199 Georgian Lane. So it's probably okay. more. We're, yeah, we're not there right now. We're on Eugenia Presta. Okay, so I'll mute myself or you can demote me either way. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that wants to speak on Eugenio Presta? <clears throat> is that to raise your hand? See no hands. Then is there a motion to adjourn to March 9th? Moved. Seconded. All in favor, Harry, aye. Ann? Aye. Tom R? Aye. Tom F? Aye. George? Aye. A021054, 199 Georgian Lane, LLC. This is an application that has been open and adjourned, but we have not heard. <clears throat> uh, there's someone to come in, Jeff is coming in now. Okay. Marty, who is the agent for this one? Charles Bowman and uh, Craig Ong. Okay. Are Charles, are either of them in the audience? Yes, they are, they're coming in now. Okay. I think I'm in now. I got promoted, yeah, Harry. I yes, got promoted. Sure. I got promoted to a panelist. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is your application. Would you like to present it, please? 
Uh, sure. Um, I think this is an application. And now, hold on. I just lost you. We didn't lose you. Did, uh, you lost me. He's we can in here, you, Charles. Chuck. Oh, now he's gone. <clears throat> Hi, Jeff. Someone said hello. Hello. I did. Hi there. Charles is back. <clears throat> okay, members of the board, sorry. I don't know what happened there because I don't think I pushed the wrong button, but uh, whatever. Um, this uh, is an application that we have been uh, working on actually pretty diligently with staff. Uh, there's an existing house there that was covering about 1800 square feet, including porches. It had an existing in-ground pool. Chuck, uh, Chuck, do you have capability of sharing a screen or Kapina, do you have a survey? Uh, I don't. I thought uh, the town usually puts up the survey on the screen. That's fine. We can do that. It's just very Thank handy you. to watch it as you talk. Oh, no, no, that's fine. I think this these plans actually are great. And one half the plans have existing, one half have proposed. Um, so I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a great plan that uh, Craig Arm had, had prepared. Um, if you go to the existing... Uh, which is on the, the screen that you have right now. Um, there was applications in the past. Um, and you can see that there's a covenanted buffer, which is green. Um, there was actually a very pretty cool house uh, on it. I mean, I'm just talking about an old Southampton resident and it was uh, uh, about 1800 and, and uh, some square feet uh, footprint with porches. Um, you access it or also uh, Georgian by way of a right-of-way. Uh, the property itself is only uh, 0.9 acres in size. Um, and again, there's a pool down by uh, the wetland area. And it's, if you look at the wetland area, there's a uh, stone wall that had existed for many, many years uh, that runs along the um, north uh, east side of the property along the wetland line. So when we first looked at this uh, parcel, um, we knew that we had to deal with a number of issues. One was FEMA, uh, of course. Two was the 100 foot uh, 325 setback requirement. Um, and what we've done, if we go to the existing uh, as opposed to the proposed, let's go to the proposed one now. Uh, you can see that the proposal is, of course, to demolish the house, um, to construct a new home, which is larger. Uh, the pool gets filled in. The sanitary system uh, gets uh, changed to an IA system. Um, we are still under the actually equal to the 20% uh, requirement of the town of Southampton lot coverage. We exceed all the DEC setback requirements. We've increased the buffer 
uh, right up to the wall uh, from the covenant and buffer that was already existed. And um, the plans itself and the <clears throat> instruction of how the pool uh, will be built and how the sanitary built has all been discussed with both Marty and the building department so that we know it complied. Marty initially had raised some um, questions uh, as he usually does. And in this case uh, were very proper questions on how we could reduce the amount of fill to the, uh, just the fill that was necessary for the sanitary. We went back to the engineer uh, we used the most shallow uh, leaching pools that we possibly could that you could still drive over because you can see the parking here is uh, quite limited. Access is quite limited. Um, you know, if we tried to put the sanitary anywhere else, it would be closer to the wetlands. We wouldn't meet any of the setbacks. So it was quite an exercise in trying to reduce the fill as much as possible. And, and what you should keep in mind is that uh, some of the fill that we are proposing, um, uh, 147 yards of the fill that we are proposing um, is actually to fill in the existing pool. Um, we also reduce some of the grades uh, landward of that wall I was talking about. Uh, so again, uh, that provide for drainage down towards uh, the wetland areas. Um, so, you know, I, I think working with staff, um, uh, it was very beneficial. I mean, we met out there, we went through a couple of iterations, um, and, and I, I think, and I, I can't speak for staff, but I think this is actually a, a very reasonable uh, plan that meets, um, all the criteria of 325, it meets all the criteria of Article 25 of DEC, it meets all the criteria of the town zoning requirements. And um, I uh, would just leave it at that, that it, it seems like um, the, best, the best we can do. It's a, uh, obviously a constrained lot as far as access goes and the wetlands, uh, but it's, uh, it's actually a very cool site, very difficult to work with, but I think this all turned out very well. Chuck, a couple of questions. Uh, could you tell me what your setback is from the wetland to the pool? Oh, it's 100. Everything meets the 100 foot setback. Okay, uh, good. And or exceeds it. It's, it meets or exceeds. Okay, yeah, the, the drawing is a little bit small for me to read. And what is the setback to the IA system? Uh, it exceeds the 150 feet. Okay. I mean, like I said, we were constrained. We, we had to make it fit. And that's yep. why it's got to be in the driveway, which was then kind of a problem because many of the Suffolk County Health Department systems, you cannot drive over. Uh, and what I mean, is the width of the buffer? Well, the, if, you go back to, if you go back to the existing, if you go back to the existing, that's what is covenanted now. And now if you go back to the proposed, you'll see we increase the buffer to the uh, pink, the, the pink area, so that the buffer goes right up to the existing wall on it. And, mm -hmm. and I will say that the, the last buffer uh, and wetland line were done by InterScience quite a few years ago. And uh, we uh, had actually delineated the new wetland line and they're, they're actually within feet of each other. And uh, Marty can certainly speak to that, but I, I think we're actually adding, adding to the, to the buffer area uh, as, as well. And what is the average width of the buffer or approximately? Oh, it's greater than 75 feet easily. Okay. Um, I'm I'm looking, I'm good. trying to read it. I'm trying to read it too, Harry. So okay, good. Uh, yeah, that's what the code calls for. Uh, great, you did a good job on that. We appreciate that. Well, I, it's just it's not me. I, I think it's one of the advantages uh, of actually meeting meeting with staff and looking at the site 
in person and trying to figure out how best to, uh, you know, accomplish people's goals while, while meeting chapter 325. I, you know, it, it was actually a very good experience, so. Okay. And the last question is, what is the footprint of the house? Uh, it's about a 4,400 square foot house. Uh, uh, footprint? Yes. It's 20%, which is what is allowed by the town code. Okay. It is a huge house. Um, however, it does not, but you meet the setbacks and it does not look like the setbacks would make, would be much different by reducing the size of the house. Um, it does, the it setbacks is, it would be the same, Harry, and we, you know, yeah. we could cut off yeah. the north side of the house and make the house smaller. But, you know, I, I don't know whether that was going to, and, but again, you know, we're putting in the IA we ask, system. We ask the applicant to reduce the size of the house. It's usually for a specific purpose to increase the buffer. It often is to increase the buffer. This is one of those cases where uh, the code <clears throat> puts the onus on us because you already meet the recommended setbacks. So yeah. I, just, I just was curious about the size. Uh, I'm not suggesting you reduce it because we really don't. No, I, I think that I, I think the goal of this was to come in before the conservation board, um, the town DEC, and not ask for a single variance. That that that's, that's our good. that's our goal, and what and I think we accomplished it. All right. Thank you. Uh, does the board have any questions? Yeah, I just want to make sure there's there's a provision to allow the driveway to go over the septic system in this new configuration that we have. Oh, ab ab absolutely. Okay. Well, we have to. We don't we don't have any any choice, and Perfect. that's why if you look at the Senate, if you look at the sanitary design, uh, we had to go with cast iron covers, shallower uh, leaching pools that would be able to support uh, driveway, um, you know, driving over it which is a, in Suffolk County Health Department is a huge problem. I mean, you know, you know, it, it, it's, uh, this is the only design that we could possibly use. Yeah, it, it used to be a very, uh, you know, remote exception that we saw this happen, but now with the IA systems, I know it's something that's, uh, that's been figured out. So that's fine. As long as, it, with, with, with the weight of, uh, you know, fuel delivery trucks and emergency vehicles that may be heavy weight, I just want to make sure that that's all considered. No, it, it has been considered. And, uh, and again, the, the advantage with the IA system is that you have many, many leaching pools rather than uh, the rings that we're typically used for, you know, so uh, you can actually spread it out and, uh, and the technology has advanced, but, uh, you know, so uh, this is approvable by the health department. Understood. And actually we just received our DEC permit today as well, so. Thank you, Chuck. Anyone else with questions? Morty? Yeah, um, good evening, uh, members of the uh, board. Marty Shea, Chief mm -hmm. Environmental Analyst for the uh, town. Um, I'll be uh, somewhat uh, brief. Um, as uh, indicated by the applicant, uh, since I had completed my uh, initial advisory report, which dates back to November 15, 2021, which is uh, part of the uh, public uh, record. Um, I have worked uh, closely uh, with uh, the applicant uh, to um, refine the original uh, plans. Um, as indicated, uh, I had uh, great concern with uh, regards to the initial plan as it called for uh, importing uh, large uh, quantities of uh, fill uh, to the uh, site. Uh, uh, we uh, look for uh, applicants to uh, respect the uh, existing uh, terrain as much as is practicable and also to avoid uh, fill uh, deposition in uh, any areas that uh, fall within uh, FEMA uh, flood zones. 
uh, our concern, of course, if, is if the land is significantly modified and uh, elevated, uh, that will have um, an adverse impact in terms of natural flooding and uh, drainage uh, patterns and could displace uh, flood waters onto neighboring uh, properties. So the initial uh, plans um, had called for uh, placement of fill, not only for the purposes of uh, raising the uh, new uh, home, but also to construct an elevated uh, pool and a terrace um, as indicated, uh, the plans have been uh, significantly uh, modified in that regard, such that uh, the only uh, fill that is being utilized for this uh, project now um, is for the uh, purposes of elevating the uh, IAOWTS as uh, required by Suffolk County Department of Health Services. This is a somewhat of a unique site in that um, the existing residentially improved portions of the property are uh, elevated significantly above the wetlands and uh, natural uh, buffering areas because of the uh, presence of a uh, vertical uh, wall uh, is separating the horticulturally improved areas and lawn from the uh, natural areas. Um, the, the buffer is actually uh, shy of the uh, required 75 feet. Um, it's actually about 60 feet. Um, but uh, because of the significant uh, vertical uh, separation between the uh, residentially improved areas and, and the uh, natural uh, areas, um, I uh, didn't uh, see a great need uh, to expand that buffer uh, further uh, landward. As indicated by the applicant, uh, the uh, construction uh, complies with the uh, minimum required 100 foot uh, wetland uh, building uh, setback. The uh, sanitary system location would exceed the minimum required 150 uh, foot uh, setback. Um, the, what, what we're actually uh, looking to do on this side is actually uh, drop the existing uh, grades uh, a bit. Uh, right now, um, the lawn is uh, somewhat high and uh, close to the top of the uh, retaining wall. Uh, that elevation will be dropped down a bit, not only uh, to ensure that the redevelopment plans uh, work in terms of FEMA uh, compliance, uh, but to also avoid um, the potential for excessive uh, flooding um, and uh, ponding within the residentially improved um, areas and to prevent um, excessive uh, sheet runoff uh, from being uh, contributed to the uh, natural areas. Um, the area where the applicant is proposing to expand the buffer is uh, well uh, vegetated uh, right now. Uh, so um, there's no need uh, for active uh, native uh, planting. Um, the uh, area has a uh, consequence of native uh, revegetation that we had previously uh, required pursuant to a prior permit is uh, quite uh, diverse. Um, there are little uh, invasives except for the uh, reeds along the immediate uh, shoreline. And uh, the area uh, provides a valued uh, wildlife uh, habitat. Uh, the uh, setback of the uh, new uh, residence, while it would be uh, closer than the existing uh, residence, um, should be um, uh, sufficient to uh, minimize excessive 
um, visual and noise impacts to wildlife using that area along the uh, shoreline. Um, the uh, swimming pool that is uh, being proposed, of course, will be a uh, saltwater uh, pool to uh, minimize concern about uh, chlorine uh, impacts. Um, so I, I think uh, while uh, the, ex uh, the uh, proposed residence is significantly larger um, than uh, what um, is existing uh, right now, I, I think the, the plan uh, works for this uh, site. Um, of course, uh, we could have entertained um, uh, possible demolition and removal of that retaining wall along the uh, shoreline um, and restoration for the uh, landlord. Um, but uh, that would have uh, resulted in a considerable uh, disturbance. And uh, sometimes that uh, vertical uh, separation can be uh, beneficial in terms of um, uh, ensuring that the uh, protected areas are more uh, attractive to wildlife and more uh, useful uh, to uh, wildlife as well. Um, yes, uh, it's big uh, change uh, for this uh, property, um, but um, if you were to look at the uh, aerial, uh, of this area, it is within an area where there are very uh, large uh, residences. Um, so, um, you know, I think uh, the applicant has been uh, most uh, cooperative in uh, working uh, with uh, my office to uh, refine the uh, plans. And I think these uh, plans um, you know, considering the existing uh, site conditions uh, work for this uh, site. Thank you. All right, thank you for those brief comments. Uh, is there someone in the audience who would like to speak in this application? I, I would. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, can I just mention, I think Chris Goldler is waiting to come into the room if somebody can take care of that. Uh, may I proceed? You. Proceed, please. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and, and board members. I'm Jeff Bragman of 15 Railroad Avenue, East Hampton. I represent two neighbors, um, one to the south of the property, uh, Jeff Cole, and the other uh, to the south and west of the property, uh, Eric Giliotti. Um, and I have some concerns, uh, notwithstanding the efforts that Marty has made to um, uh, try to make the uh, project uh, a little bit more uh, friendly to the habitat and the constraints of the property. Um, I think we're not paying a lot of attention to how much of a significant increase in the size of the house this is. The application call actually called it a 4,400 square foot house. It's, it, that's the, the footprint is 4,467 square feet. So the gross floor area is more than 8,900 square feet. It's nearly three times the size of the existing house, which is 3,246 square feet. That's a very big change to this property. Um, if you look at the build out of the house, I think, it's, I think it is important for the board to look at the build, the build out of, of the property pretty carefully because at every uh, point where it's possible to put a structure, there is structure virtually up to and over um, required um, setbacks. Um, the house is built out completely from the front property line. It's filled with structure from the front property line. And the uh, structures in the rear um, are as close as six inches to the uh, setback line. Um, and that means that there's gonna be uh, inevitable disturbance beyond. It means there's not a lot of wiggle room um, to install uh, structures and the house when you build, you know, right to the to the setback line or within uh, six inches of it. Also, um, the house is uh, uh, it has expanded uh, sideways. I'm sorry about the dog barking. I knew that might happen. Um, the house has expanded 
into the side yard setbacks. Apparently they're using um, the relief section or they're planning to use the relief section under 330-83K. Um, um, and I think it's worth mentioning a word about that section because it basically says that you can cut down uh, setbacks uh, by 50% um, in, in an application that comes in front of your board. However, however, um, it's, not, it's, it's not mandatory and it is, it, it is, it's stated in the law that those exceptions to setbacks are only to be made when uh, they're made in order to increase the buffer. And the interesting point about this case is that th these, these, this relief and you know, going into the otherwise required R60 setbacks, not only does it not increase the width of the buffer, it, it, and obviously the statute is written to protect the wetlands because basically it's saying <coughs> if a property owner can increase the, the buffer from the wetlands, we'll give him relief from his setbacks. Well, in this case, this applicant is using the relief section to build a bigger house. So he's actually widening his house, which makes it bigger and more impacting um, and, and doesn't do anything to increase the buffer. So he, he's not entitled to that relief. And so I think it's worth noting that on the front, the sides where he exceeds what would otherwise be required and in the rear, he has built literally up to the lines where he can build. So it's not an exaggeration to call this a maximum build plan. And despite the fact that it is a very large expansion, and I, I, I have to gently disagree with Marty and say that yes, there are, there are large houses in the area, but we have to deal with you know, what we now know about the constraints of the property. Um, this board, when it looked at a much smaller house with only 3,246 square feet, it imposed the buffer that you see on the map right now. That's really, that was imposed by this board to accommodate a 3,200 square foot house. The prior owner came in and needed to catch up with some additions he had made to the house. So that buffer represents, you know, what you felt was protective for a 3,200 30, square foot house, not an 8,900 square foot house, almost three times larger. Also, it's unclear to me where the retaining walls are. I think we should have a diagram of where the retaining walls are. I'm not sure how that pool is, 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 gonna, is gonna work. If it, I believe I read that it was an infinity edge pool. And uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have an answer as to whether it's being built into the deck or, but it, 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 it's clear that if it's built into the deck, it's gonna be elevated and they're gonna to have to put fill underneath it. It's not gonna just be, uh, I, I don't, we don't know how they're gonna handle that. Maybe they can explain that. So I, I think that the retaining wall situation uh, should be explained. And I, I think it's, it's worth paying careful attention to the fact that, that those structures are within six inches of the setback line. Um, so what I'm saying is there's not a lot of breathing room on this property. Um, and I'm not saying that just as an aesthetic matter um, because I wanna connect it to some of the constraints on the property. Um, the applicant reports the depth of groundwater to be 4.5 feet. That is an extremely low uh, depth to, to groundwater. And it's, it's because it was measured um, at a time likely when, when the bay was opened or had been opened and was closed and water was down. It's at one of the low points. And uh, we have uh, uh, Frank Piccinini who was gonna speak after me, has a, a USGS data that indicates that that 4.5 depth to groundwater is the low point in the groundwater. And, the, and I think the bo this board probably understands pretty well that groundwater here fluctuates a great deal because Meacox Bay, when it's, closed fills up and the lots adjacent to it fill up with water and that makes the water level high so you've got very high depth to a uh, very high groundwater which means shallow depth to groundwater it's likely go and we can give you some numbers on this it's, it's going to be much much shallower than 4.5 feet which means and i think this is significant that 
the dry wells here are going to lose a lot of their functionality because they're going to fill up. And, and they're not a great idea. I'll get to some of the, the, um, the features of the property, which, which militate against putting in dry wells, because you don't want to dry this property, property out. But also the fluctuating groundwater is going to affect the septic function. You've got a bit, this is an 8,900 square foot house. I don't know how many bedrooms it is. I haven't seen, I don't think the plan that I had showed that. But when you have a high fluctuating groundwater, it's gonna intrude on the septic system. And that septic system is gonna lose efficacy. It's not gonna do the job that it should do if it was really in, land, in solid land with a good separation between it and groundwater. That's another indication that this board should take a look at the size of this house. Um, it's certainly, uh, uh, it, it's, the, in, in addition, um, the fact that, that you've pushed the, um, the rear decking and the pool right up to the setback um, in, a, in a maximum build plan, when you look at the constraints from groundwater alone, it suggests that it's worth the board considering a slightly more restrained design. They could, they could easily pull that, that decking back to give a little bit more breathing room, given the fact that you've got these groundwater issues here. And a smaller pool is going to be, is going to be less disturbance, it's going to be less coverage, and it's going to be, it's going to be decanting less water. And I know it's a saltwater pool, but every pool, every pool that you construct needs chlorine. I'm not saying it needs a chlorine system, but in my experience, every pool, even the ones that use non-chlorine systems need occasional chlorine and there are dry wells for this pool. And, it's, and the water is gonna be decanted in there. You know that they're gonna have to empty that pool. And, and the dry, as I said, the dry wells are gonna be affected by the fluctuations in the groundwater. Um, a pool of any size is going to require backwashing. What I'm suggesting here is not, you know, not that nothing can be built here. Uh, I'm not saying that this is an application that is, you know, uh, a terrible application and you've got to start over, you know, from the drawing board uh, from a blank slate on it. But what I am suggesting is that a more compact, a more compact design, a slightly more compact design um, is going to mean that there's less runoff, there's less disturbance, there's less risk of sedimentation, there's more room for wetland vegetation to do what it does. Runoff is a very serious issue on this property. Um, we know it floods. Uh, the neighbors have seen it flood during Superstorm Sandy. Uh, the neighbor to the south's dock, floating dock, became an accessory structure in the backyard of this, of this house. So flooding is, is, is a, a problem here. The high, the high groundwater and the groundwater fluctuation contributes to flooding. That's another reason that they should restrain themselves slightly on the size of the house. A smaller house, less disturbance, less runoff, less impervious surfaces, less septic effluent. It makes sense. Shallow groundwater affects a number of things. The, these issues relate to the features. The cove and the bay are already compromised. The cove is permanently closed to shell fishing. Um, and, and, you know, a wider, bigger house is going to be more impacting on the buffer. And in fact, this plan offers really almost nothing in terms of increased buffer while it brings in a house that's almost 9,000 square feet almost three times the size of the existing house for which you required um, the buffer that's already there. Um, the proximity to Hayground uh, Cove and Meacox Bay is very important to consider. This property is characterized as a high priority water quality improvement zone under uh, section 325.9E. Your board has the discretion to expand the buffer for extremely sensitive areas. This area is defined as an extremely sensitive water quality improvement zone. Um, that's what the town, what that's what is in the town's regulations. 
Um, and and uh, uh, Frank Piccinini is going to give you some of the criteria that are used to, to uh, put this lot in, into that um, category. And what I'm saying is that a more restrained uh, design, one that pulls that house, maybe pulls the house in from the sides and reduces the overall square footage, pulls that decking back. I mean, he's got an outdoor kitchen there. Um, you know, and what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that some of the bells and whistles that you get with these grand houses that are going in probably should give way to the importance of the features that are being affected on the lot and adjusting the house will do it. A uh, storm surge is absorbed by wetlands. That's a big part of their, their functions. In addition, Frank Piccinini, who will follow me, um, will highlight for you the presence of freshwater wetland vegetation on the property. That shows that the property is wet. Wetland vegetation needs to have its feet wet. It wouldn't be living if it weren't, if they didn't have that condition. And, you know, that, that means that you, you, we don't have to prove that ponding and runoff are a problem. It's shown by the vegetation. And this house is taking up so much of the buildable envelope, virtually the entire buildable envelope, that there, it's not leaving any room for the wetlands to do what they do. And I would like to suggest to the board tonight that um, both can be accommodated. Um, you can get a pretty, pretty nice house here and, and, and be a little bit more restrained and improve the wetland functions. Now, uh, Frank, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Chris Gobler is gonna follow Frank Piccinini and he's gonna talk to you about the connectivity between uh, the Cove, Hayground Cove and Meacock's Bay. But they're, they're directly related. Uh, Hayground Cove is a source of contamination for Meacox and Meacox is an amazing ecosystem and it's filled with threatened and endangered species. And anything you do to further degrade the water quality, and remember this septic system is gonna have trouble functioning for a big house. Anything you do is going right into Meacox because when they open Meacox, all the water that's been contained and has risen high on the land and all the runoff goes right flushes right into Meacox Bay. So we should be working to be more protective, not less protective. Um, and Meacox, they're, they're harvesting oysters in Meacox. And my understanding is that oysters grow in Hayground Cove. They can't be eaten there, but they propagate. So, you know, anything you do that is inclined to push the cove uh, into what the scientists call an anoxic situation, a low oxygen situation, really is a peril to Meacox Bay. The answer here is not engineering dry wells. The dry wells are gonna fill up um, and, and Frank will show you the data. It's on, a, it's on like a fever chart. You can see it and you can see the, the date when they, when they did their, their test boring, that it was at a low, a low point. Um, they're, they're not gonna have the capacity. So you're gonna have runoff that's not gonna be contained by them, including the pool runoff, a reason to make a slightly smaller pool. What I wanna suggest is also that although there's a retaining wall over that lawn area, that's a really bad idea to keep that. And it's a really bad idea that the applicant, let me rephrase that. I think it would be, I'd like to suggest to the board that it would be uh, more, uh, uh, it, it, it would facilitate the functioning of the wetlands. It would promote surface water quality. It would uh, tend to eliminate surface water runoff if instead of a lawn there, they expanded the buffer with wetland species and created a rain garden there. Because there, if, if you're not building right up to the 100 foot line, which I think is not a good idea, there's plenty of room there to establish a rain garden, a rain garden with real wetland species, which will thrive because they're already on the lot. And if you do that, then, you, then your drainage capacity is gonna be handled naturally by like a bioswale. 
So you're, you're going to be enhancing um, the functionality of the existing wetlands there. You're going to be absorbing some of the runoff. When storms come, it's going to help absorb storm surge. It's going to do what nature likes to do with wetlands and why they exist. And if you do that, then you're going to promote the goals of the wetlands law, chapter 325, by protecting the habitat that Frank can tell you about, protecting the estuary, the mixing of the salt and freshwater, maintaining the shellfish. They're connected to, to, uh, uh, to the cove, the cove and the bay, and improving surface waters, preventing over enrichment, which we know is a huge problem. So I want to just end by, by urging you um, to take a little more time and um, think about requiring the applicant to be slightly more restrained with the construction that he's doing. Um, it's, you, you know, he's up to an 8,900 square foot house with a 40 foot long swimming pool and an outdoor kitchen. Perhaps there could be a little bit of give there so that he could give back uh, to the wetlands. What I'm, what I'm asking you to do, and I, and I think a good start would be pull him in on the sides. He, he, you, you, you don't, you should not be giving him relief because the, sta the standard says you should give the minimum relief necessary to increase the depth of the bunk of the buffer and nothing that he builds on the side accomplishes that. So he's not really eligible for that relief. If he just pulled it back, say on the south side to where the edge of the existing house is 35 feet and pulled it back on the north side to like 20 feet, he's still, he's still below the existing setbacks. He's getting some, some benefit, but you, the board, would be doing something that really enabled, that really actually re-energized this wetland um, and water exchange system of which this lot is a very important part in a high priority water quality improvement district. I think it's worth a second look because it's so sensitive and you have the authority to do that. I, I really urge you to have him take another look and, and let's have another iteration of a plan that's a little bit more sensitive to the natural features on the site. That's all I have. I may want a little time at the end, but Frank Piccinini, I'd like, if possible, we could hear him and then Dr. Goldberg. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Could I interject real quick just before we get to something and another speaker? Um, the survey says Hay Ground Bay, it's Hay Ground Cove. Maybe you could correct that. I'm sorry, where did it say Hay, Hay Ground Bay? Say the, the, the survey says Hay Ground Bay, it's Hay yeah, Ground I, Cove. I refer to it as Cove, yeah. So that has to be corrected. And there's a spot that it says Gerogian instead of Georgian. Maybe that could be fixed just to be accurate. Frank, you that, that was the, yeah, that was directed to uh, Mr. Bowman, I imagine. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Surveyor typos. Okay. Okay. Uh, may I begin? Please. Are you going to screen share, Frank? I, I am going to screen share, but um, another participant is sharing, so they'll have to. Um, yep. Thank you. All right. Just bear with me for a moment, folks. Huh. I apologize, I have too many windows open on my screen. Can you all see my, my presentation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Frank Piccinini from Simple Consulting. Um, I'm here with uh, with Jeff just to kind of put a little bit more finer technical point on, on some of the, the points that he made already. Um, I'll try to be brief in the interest of everybody. Um, you know, Jeff hit on a lot of these things, uh, but but I did want to first take you through some of the, the, the context here. 
Um, so Meacox Bay and Hay Ground Cove um, are, are very productive systems. Um, so th this is actually pulled straight from a report, the Meacox Bay Management Plan that your own uh, Marty Shea actually drafted or had a role in drafting. And these are all uh, federally and state threatened species that are exist in and around the area, uh, including you know the subject property. In fact, um, I was on the phone with Jeff uh, when he was at a neighbor's house watching bald eagles uh, fly by the area. So it's a, it's a highly productive system uh, and certainly worth protecting, which is why um, there has been so much attention from the, the town, and rightfully so, uh, to, to really uh, restore and protect the functioning of the system. Um, so, you know, we have this water quality management plan updated in 20, 2019 and uh, high, high uh, parcels that are defined as priority areas uh, are, are defined as such. So I, I highlighted the, the, the definition here uh, that I think apply to this lot. So homes that are built on small lots, uh, certainly, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody, I thought somebody was talking. Um, homes that are built on small lots, and certainly it's not a small lot, but it's a big house and effectively is becoming a small lot. So I think that one applies, arguably. Shallow depth of groundwater, yes. Um, FEMA slash stones, yes. Uh, impermeable for uh, too porous or too impermeable for proper treatment of wastewater. We'll certainly, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, but uh, impermeable, yes. Areas where the groundwater reaches surface water bodies relatively quickly. And if they're listed uh, by a listed species, um, I'm sorry, by a water body listed as impaired under the SPEDES, the State Pollution Discharge Elimination System. So, so that's that's all right. And um, add to that the fact that it's it's certainly with zero to two groundwater to surface travel times, uh, given the fact that it's directly adjacent. We don't need models to know that. It's just common sense. So it's certainly in a high priority area. Just to give you the spatial context, I think we all kind of get this, but I, I want to and Dr. Gobler will, will go through some of the connectivity between Meacox Bay and, um, you know, and, and the, uh, its, its tributaries. So this is just a map to kind of show you what the, the spatial area. Um, and, and as I had mentioned, uh, unfortunately, uh, Meacox Bay and its tributaries are uh, defined as impaired water bodies under the, uh, it's actually, it's state regulation that is from the Clean Water Act. So um, fecal coliform is the pollutant of concern. Um, so, it is uh, the state, uh, federal and state law require the town of yeah. South Penn and arguably the conservation board uh, to reduce discharge of pollutants to the maximum extent practical. Yeah, that's the legal jargon. Um, and, you know, we, we also have, and, and again, I mentioned there's a lot of uh, attention paid to the uh, restoration and, and protection of this very valuable water body. Um, and, and to the, to the point where uh, a very large and, and comprehensive management plan was drafted I know the draft form was was drafted by uh, by Mr. Shea, um, and so these are just some of the uh, you know the, the points of it. I, we don't need to I don't need to read uh, that to you. Frank, Frank, uh, yeah. it'd be helpful to the board if you talk about the applicant here, the, the the application, the site here. We're all familiar with Meacox Bay. We've all read the management plan. We don't need to rehearse that, and we have a lot of things to go on the agenda, and that really much just plus wastes our time because it's redundant for what we're doing. So stick with the site. And okay. The All right. So, yeah, right. Sticking with the site. Um, so threats identified by the management plan are all, um, you know, it, it's a good, it's a good, um, you know. But the management plan, thing. we're talking about the application on Georgian Way. Yeah, no, I, I understand. And and the, the plan um, are actually, is going to contribute to all the threats identified by the, the Meacox Bay management plan. So input of sediments, nutrients, fertilizer, pesticides, yes. Harmful algal blooms. I'm not going to read this. It sounds like you're anxious for me to keep going. Uh, but you know, I'm just getting into I'm not, the I'm not now. don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I want you to give us something that's helpful. All that is not okay. helpful. <laughs> All right. Well, flooding in uh yeah, fair enough. Um flooding in Meacox Bay, right? Uh so so uh one one other takeaway that that we need to talk about and is directly relevant to this is the fact that at, you know, when they open the cut, uh you, you have higher uh groundwater elevations. And why is that an issue? Okay. Back down to the plan, you know. So, so I took you out to the uh, to the to the broader scale, zooming it back down to the application. Um, you know, at your suggestion here, uh, a lot of the uh, the so looking at the test hold data, uh, you know, it's just one of them, and a lot of the uh, design features are predicated on minimum separations. Um, so the pool has to have the minimum two foot, sanitary leaching galley three foot, and the dry wells have to have have two feet. Um, and it's all predicated on this this one test hole. Um, that was taken in January 2021, 
Uh, and, and you can just see it here. Uh, not, not only are they, are they thinking, uh, you know, is the assumption made that uh, we have this, this one test hole uh, and, and it's at a certain level, but their, their plans are all premised under the assumption that this is the highest expected groundwater level. Uh, and we know that's just a wildly inaccurate assumption. Uh, and, and you can look no further than the groundwater fluctuations in a nearby well. Um, in fact, you can look at the, the approximate date of the test well, it, it's, it's at an almost historic low, right? So, um, you know, their, their entire plan is predicated on adequate, adequate separation. And that's really important for the adequate functioning of dry wells, for the adequate functioning of the septic systems and so on. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's a completely unfounded assumption to say that, you know, that well is the maximum expected um, depth of groundwater. Uh, and, and we know this is true based on site-specific evidence. Uh, and, and we can look right here. Uh, I, I know uh, Jeff had mentioned wetlands on the site within the buffer area, um, but the vegetative, uh, the evidence is that it's not just a wetland, but this is a freshwater influence system here. Um, so you see Phragmites, um, despite its association with tidal areas, um, it is actually highly intolerant of high salt con concentration within the soil. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the chemistry here and the, and the biological feedback me mechanisms, mechanisms, but the general gist of it is that if you see Phragmites growing in an area, it's only because it's a highly freshwater influence system. Um, same thing with groundsel bush. Uh, red maple, it's a facultative wetland plant, so it has to have wet feet uh, to grow properly. Um, I have a question mark because uh, leaf off identification from an aerial photo is a little bit tough. Uh, but, you know, I have a hunch that that's a red maple based on the, the colors of the bud. Uh, but nonetheless, the, you don't need anything more than the Phragmites to see that this is a very soupy area. Um, it is dominated by freshwater wetland, overland flow, stormwater runoff, and, and you know, effectively, you know, I know we're right next to this, this tidal saline uh, uh, saltwater system. Um, however, the vegetation, uh, just because of the persistence of the Phragmites, we know that this is a highly... Um, it's highly influenced by freshwater systems. So this is a dynamic edge between um, salt and, and freshwater. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's wet. And, um, you know, you could also look at some other, the other assumptions here. Um, so the, the impermeable surfaces are gonna jump way up from 10.8% to 19%. Um, but, you know, unfortunately the runoff that's gonna certainly emanate from some of these other permeable features, such as the lawn and the, the driveway area, um, are not at all accounted for. Um, so even if we can get over the minimum depth to groundwater and the adequate separation for the proper functioning of dry wells, um, they're, they're largely undersized based on um, lacking assumptions uh, or faulty assumptions within the engineering calculations. It's like Stony Brook. And it's only going to get worse. Um, you know, it, this is from the uh, I, IPCC uh, physical science basis. And, and you know, our climate continues to uh, our climate continues to change. Storms are more frequent, and more severe. We're seeing this in our lifetimes. This was, you know, when I was in graduate school, which wasn't that that long ago. Uh, this was something that was far away, and you know, we'd have to worry about when when my kids were older. Um, but it's it's happening now, and we need to plan for the future with what we're doing. And so, recommendations here, um, and I told you I'd be brief, and and you know, I'm, I'm, this is my last slide. Um, okay. You you folks have the authority under the code. Um, to increase the to increase the buffer when uh, when it's adjacent to extremely sensitive areas, we're not here jumping up and down saying no house here. This is outrageous. Uh, we've been you know we've been on other applications where where that was uh, the case. This is not that. We understand that something's going to be built here. Something is already built here. Uh, but it, it's worth looking at this application as an opportunity to make a difference to plan for the future. And to to affect change with what we're doing, just because some of the other uh, land use decisions maybe a decade ago, twenty years ago, were were not um, you know very well uh, well grounded in, in some of this future oriented planning, um, doesn't mean that this application should should avoid that that additional scrutiny. Uh, and here we have an opportunity to to make a more modest house potentially, um, or at least increase the size of the the mandated buffer. Uh, why do we need a lawn? adjacent to the existing freshwater area. And I have a note here, focus on above ground storage solutions. Um, these dry wells are, you know, when you need them to function during a rainstorm or during tidal areas, they're not gonna function because they're, they're so close to the groundwater well, they'll basically be filled up. So there needs to be some mechanism for these dry wells to have an overflow. 
on the projects that I build, um, when we do use dry wells, which is not that often, the overflow pipe is directed um, to some sort of biofiltration system or a rain garden. Um, and that, that lawn area uh, that's just, you know, somewhat ex excessive, excessive um, for, for the lot, especially given the context here, is a perfect place to have some, uh, some ecological functioning, some freshwater wetlands uh, existing and in a place for stormwater to kind of at least be slowed down and have a chance to infiltrate before it starts to blast that buffer area and worse the, the cove. So that's, that's the, my comments and I, and I really appreciate your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> uh, does someone else would like to speak? We have uh, Chris Gobler should be on. Oh, there he is. I'm on. Hello, Chris. Good, good evening. Um, I fully respect you have a lot to do, so I'm going to try to make my points quickly, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm presuming you can still hear me and see my slides? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Okay, um, so... I want to just first talk about wastewater and sizes of homes and just get to the bottom line that when you have a larger home, it tends to have more bedrooms. Bedrooms is how the Suffolk County determines how large a septic system needs to be because it's assuming more bedrooms, more people, more flow, and then ultimately uh, more nitrogen coming out of the system. Um, just to talk about Mecox Bay quickly, I know we know a lot about it, just to give some fine detail. Um, firstly, if, if you're not aware, Suffolk County in 2020 completed its most comprehensive study ever of all of Long Island, dividing it up into more than 200 what they called sub-watersheds. And its evaluation of Mecox Bay is that it had, it had the highest ecological sensitivity, uh, and it also was calling for some of the highest nitrogen reduction of any system across anywhere in Suffolk County asking that the nitrogen levels be reduced by 63%. There's good reasons for this. We already heard that it's impaired water body. Um, I just want to point out, I've been studying this water body for more than 20 years. Uh, this publication that I put out in 2005 on this system uh, began with the study, uh, the data collection and the data in the papers from 2001 through 2002. In this study, we demonstrated this is the levels of nitrogen uh, in Mecox Bay, in the tributaries entering Mecox Bay, and in the groundwater. And so I just want to emphasize here, this is a system that's being loaded with a lot of nitrogen. And even despite the lot, lot high levels of nitrogen in the groundwater entering Mecox Bay, it's still very sensitive to nitrogen. And I, won't, I can't explain this entire table, but these are experiments we did where we used water from Mecox Bay and did nothing to it or added nitrogen. And what I wanna emphasize is that as soon as you get into summer and through fall, if you look at these numbers here, these are the rate at which the algae grow and you can increase those growth rates by an order of magnitude just by adding a little bit more nitrogen. Some of the concerns from more nitrogen have to do with toxic algae. Uh, Blue-green algae produce toxins that can be uh, gastrointestinal or neurotoxins. Um, they can cause cancer, and they're also dangerous to pets. And I'll emphasize that um, it was about five years ago that the Suffolk County Health Department got a call about poisoning of a dog uh, on Mecox Bay during a blue-green algae bloom. Um, Mill Pond, which connects to Mecox Bay, this is data just from this year showing that it spends most of the year with levels of blue-green algae above the New York State DEC threshold. That, of course, flushes into Mecox Bay, where we then see high levels of blue-green algae above, again, that threshold or very near that threshold for a good part of the summer and or fall. Um, we've seen multiple types of blue-green algae in Mecox Bay itself. We've seen one of the blue-green algal toxins in Mecox Bay at levels that exceed drinking water standards that I mentioned the dog illness, uh, the dog drinking the water from Mecox Bay. Um, we've done the research to show that more nitrogen gives you more blue-green algae as well, in addition to making the other algae grow faster. And it's not the only harmful algae we've in Mecox Bay. We've also seen uh, the marine dinoflagellate, uh, Alexandrium, which makes this toxin here called saxitoxin. This is a toxin that's 1,000 times more potent than cyanide. 
And again, found in Mecox Bay at ele elevated levels in the spring. So it's a unique ecosystem in that the salinity is low enough to permit for the freshwater toxic algae, but still high enough to allow for these marine uh, toxic algae. And they fluctuate seasonally between summer, spring and summer. We already heard that uh, what's happening with shell fishing in Mecox Bay. And I just wanna now drill down and start talking about Hay Ground Cove itself. So what this is showing is the New York State DEC shell fishing map for Mecox Bay. And what it shows you is that much of the bay is open seasonally, spring through fall. Hagerland Cove is closed year round. What this has done is actually created, um, if you didn't know, the most productive oyster fishery on the entire South Shore of Long Island. There is no ecosystem on the South Shore of Long Island from which more oysters are harvested actively than Mecox Bay. And the reason the system operates so well is actually this red closure line in Hayground Cove itself. If we need to get oysters out of Mecox Bay, we know where to go. We, you go to Hayground Cove because they're so dense and rich there uh, because the area is closed, they can't be harvested. So this zone is incredibly important. The baymen who make a living off of harvesting the oysters here rely on what we would call the spawner sanctuary here in Hayground Cove to produce the oysters that populate the entire bay. Uh, this past summer, Supervisor Schneiderman asked me to estimate if the oysters were lost in Hayground Cove, how long would it take to repopulate the bay with those oysters? And I came up with the estimate that it would be more than a decade to get back to where we are today. And I bring that up because the environmental conditions in the bay are already threatening to the oysters with regards to the harmful algal blooms and also low oxygen. <laughs> and just some images of the oysters. And again, I went through the dynamics of those um, within the system. I mentioned Supervisor Schneiderman and I wanna highlight um, a conversation I had with him this summer about Hayground Cove and Mecox Bay and an urgent memo he asked me to compose and write to him so he could then give that to the New York State DEC so there could be an emergency opening of Mecox Bay. Um, obviously, the, the, the fine print here we can't read, but I just want to highlight some of the points here because it relates back to what we're talking about here. At the time, Mecox Bay was closed. That closure of the bay, as you already know, and as I'll show more about momentarily, leads to the water levels in the bay rising up and people's basements, frankly, just flooding. Uh, in addition, it's well known that if people's basements are flooding, the septic systems in low-lying areas are flooded. And that happens every single year. That's just, a, you know, that's part of Mecox Bay. The cut closes, the water levels rise, and as the water in the bay rises, it actually pushes up the groundwater um, and puts literally the IA systems in the near shore area underwater. And then I've already talked about the other things I highlighted in the letter were the toxic algal blooms that I talked about, the threat to the oyster populations, and particularly the, com the troubling combination of the algal blooms, uh, warm summer temperatures, and the low oxygen that was being seen at the time. That oxygen levels get much lower, you could begin to lose those oysters. And again, it's nitrogen that's kicking off all of these events. Very quickly, on the wetlands front, we know how important they are for marine and, and terrestrial life. We know that they protect coastal communities. Uh, we also know that more nitrogen going from land to sea degrade. This is a CAT scan of the roots of a salt marsh. So if you don't load it with nitrogen, this is what the roots should look like. When you put lots of nitrogen, the roots begin to fall apart uh, and the wetland begins to collapse. Just honing in now, particularly on this location, in the lower right here, this is the groundwater table map from all of Mecox Bay by the USGS. If we hone in on this, on the uh, western side of Hayground Cove in particular, what, you've, what I find actually remarkable is that this site is unique when it comes to groundwater. Look at the, the levels, and then all of a sudden this is one area. Well, that one area happens to be almost exclusively this property. Right? As we'll see later on, this, is, this property is literally within a flood zone. Um, just to go again, talk about the fluctuation of water. Here's that study that I, get, I published in 2005. I put this here specifically to emphasize um, that when the cut is um, 
open, that water level drops a lot. You can have it drop by more than a meter. That's three feet. Uh, and then it rises right back up. And again, as this happens, you're getting the same kind of fluctuation in the groundwater um, it, that, that's going up and down right into septic systems. And again, this image is meant to illustrate that, you know, there's the, there's the water table, there's the septic system, you have an advanced system with a leaching galley, and then it's where you measure the groundwater. Well, if the groundwater is measured at a historic low, you can bet that when that cut closes, that groundwater level is going right up and into those septic systems. Uh, and that's problematic. Um, again, this is the, uh, we saw this earlier, this is the schematic. Uh, here's those septic systems. And note what it says here, flood zone, flood zone, flood zone. The whole thing is a flood zone. And again, USGS shows you it's an area of high groundwater table. Um, and again, this area, if measured at 2.5, feet to groundwater, that looks good. Again, that's shown here. You get your three feet to groundwater, that's all good and well, if that measurement is a historic low. But you can bet that seasonally, you know, the groundwater is gonna be right up both into the IA system and into the leaching galleys. Uh, so a few points on the IA system, I'm about to finish. Um, a Fuji clean system is being put in. Well, that's good. Um, they're rated to 19 milligrams per liter, that's good. But I'll note that that 19 milligrams per liter, I mean, I've, I've, I myself have been measuring dozens of septic systems and how they perform across Suffolk County as part of Article 19. Um, and what we see is, yes, it hits that average, but there's fluctuation. And when you have a system that's in a coastal zone that has groundwater flooding, and there's one we're monitoring, for example, at, on Georgia Capon, which is another of only three temporarily open estuaries on the south shore of Long Island, it's performing at about 40 milligrams per liter. Um, and so again, IA systems in general and the discharge in general will be less effective in shallow areas with flu fluctuating groundwater. Um, and the final disposal is gonna be in the driveway. There's gonna be no mounding. So on the one hand, that's good. There's no uh, external fill coming in, but on the other hand, you have that clearance where you think you have three feet, you're not gonna have that when the pond is closed, which it's closed more than half of the year. And instead these things will be flooded uh, and not, you won't get, you know, the, off the re one of the reasons you get, you want this is the removal of pathogens, but also the nitrification. And if you don't have that, you don't get either of those things. Um, if you don't, if they're not elevated and just put right into the, to the ground. And again, as I said before, more home means more people and more nitrogen. Uh, so this, I covered pretty much everything here. There are multiple water quality impairments. We know that Suffolk County wants to see a 63% nitrogen reduction for Meacox Bay. And when you have shallow groundwater, that makes treating that ground, the wastewater on any site uh, difficult. And, um, and with a bigger home, there's <laughs> nitrogen effluent. So with that, I will end and I will thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chris. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience that wants to speak on this application? Greg? I'd like a response, Harry. Uh, who, uh, Chuck, you said that? Yes, yeah. correct. Yes, is there, Charles, did you see anybody in the audience? The guy, Craig, that would like to speak. Right, uh, I think- Craig yeah, Arbor. I'll let, I'll let uh, can, Charles speak can, first. Let uh, me go, for, go first, if that's okay with you, Harry. Okay. I'd also like to request before I speak that you bring up the aerial photograph uh, of the uh, property uh, that showed the property and the adjoining owner. And, and, um, and, and again, what, one of the things that, as you know, that upsets me beyond belief is that Mr. Bragman's uh, client is located to the south. Please look at that house. Please look at that house there. Please look at where the pool is. Please look to see if there was any buffer. Please, I would make sure that there is a standard sanitary system 
So instead of objecting to something that we're trying to redevelop in a proper way, um, no one has mentioned that his money certainly can afford to put in an IA system. He certainly could afford to rip out his pool, move it back. And if he's so concerned with the wetlands, you know, on Meacox Bay, you know, why hasn't he done anything about it? I mean, it's just, to, to me, it, it's just a, an amazing fact of life that people have what they have and, you know, they don't want anything else. And I look at that house. It's huge. Uh, later on, I'll let Craig Arm speak to actually the size of the house, but to represent somebody with a house like that, claiming that, that there's effects to the wetlands to the north that already have a buffer is just incongruous to me. You know, I mean, it, it's unbelie unbelievable. When speaking to the freshwater wetlands questions, we, we know Meacox fluctuates. It's a very difficult situation, you know, of where groundwater really is. The only way to understand, and I'll go back to his consultant, and I don't even know where the test well data that he used, is to be able to take a test well at every point in the year when the, the cut is open and when it's closed. Um, that's the only way to tell where groundwater really is here. And the same way when we deal with the trustees on docks, they actually decide when the cut is gonna be open. And I always found it interesting and maybe uh, Chris Gobler understands this, they only open it uh, on some of them when it reaches a certain level at a certain point, and then they'll open it and it has to deal with money and the contractors and everything else. And it's a very difficult thing to actually assess. Is Meacox an Im impaired water body? Yes, absolutely. So every application that should come in should be trying to reduce the amount of nitrogen uh, in it. Um, I, I think Mr. Bragman made some unbelievably erroneous uh, statements, you know, that indicate that, uh, that the house is actually 9,000 square feet. It is not. And I'll let Craig Am Arm, uh, who's the architect, speak to that. But when you get people who are willing to, you know, look at their neighbors uh, and say, oh my God, you cannot do this while well, they're sitting in a probably 12,000 square foot house, you know, with how many bedrooms? And I could ask Mr. Bregman, how many bedrooms were in that house? How many, how, how many, uh, what kind of pool system is in that house? You know, and the answer is always, well, we haven't applied for anything, so we don't have to do anything. You know, but all of a sudden they're conservationists. You know, we all try to do the best we possibly can within the regulations that uh, are, have given to, be, uh, given to us. I grew up on Meacox Bay. I grew up going out there when I was 12 years old in a John boat crabbing. You know, I grew up in Southampton Village and no one wanted to live on Meacox Bay because it was all reeds and there's nothing there. So I get it, believe me. Flying Point's the, my favorite place in the whole world. You know, so to say that there's no concern about the water quality is, is ridiculous, you know? And I, I really object to um, his consultant. Of course, there's freshwater wetlands all along Meacox Bay. It's a brackish system. All the water comes down from Mill Pond down through there. So what a ridiculous thing to say that there's freshwater species there. Of course there are. All over Meacox Bay, there's freshwater species. And yes, the groundwater does, does uh, fluctuate tremendously. So how do you design a, 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 a properly uh, separated groundwater? How do you design a dock? I have this discussion with the trustees all the time. They have depth requirements. What is the depth going to be when the cut's open? Is the depth going to be when it's, it's closed? You don't know, that's for sure. So it ends up being a, a compromise. The last thing I say, and you know, Chris Gobler, 
I have a huge respect for. His organization we work with all the time um, on projects um, together, uh, land use and Chris Goldblatt were through joint contracts. And I, I don't know, I don't know if Chris is representing Stony Brook University. And it's a question that I really have. Is, the, is he representing Stony Brook University or is he representing himself as a consultant? I think that's very important to know. And um, not that I don't have any qualms with what he said. It was all good information, very good information. I don't object to anything that he said, but I would like to know, you know who and what uh, uh, I'm dealing with. Uh, in any applications, not just this application. So I, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Chris, uh, to uh, Craig Arm, to explain at least the size of the house and, and actually what is the, 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 the floor area, the gross floor areas of the house and how it came to be that design. Uh, sure, hi everyone, Craig Arm, um, 801 Montauk Highway, West Hampton Beach. Um, so the floor area uh, is, is approximately the 8,900 square feet, as, as mentioned. Um, essentially, I guess the, the overall, the, the big points um, of what we're doing is in terms of if we're required to be um, 150 for the sanitary, uh, we're actually about where we exceed the 175 feet for the sanitary. And yes, I know uh, the point of 100 feet for the pool was pointed out, but also the existing pool is only about 62. So we're certainly far better than what was there. And yes, there'll be some disturbance, but part of that disturbance, don't forget, is removing a pool that's only 62 feet um, as well. Um, I think just touching on the sanitary and the depth to groundwater, um, I mean, that's something done by other people, not myself, um, but we are required to have a excavation inspection from the health department who will make sure that we are our distance above groundwater. And I think every, all the other points that were brought up in terms of flood zones, we're well aware we're in a flood zone and we'll be building to FEMA compliance. Um, so I just, I don't, think that there's anything that you've brought up that we're not aware of, but I think everything uh, we're doing meets or exceeds all of the requirements um, by <clears throat> this board and, and by uh, the building department and zoning as well. And, and where's the buffer on the southern adjoining property? Where let's is stick. that? Look, look, look at that house. Chuck, let's stick with the application. That we have. No, I, I know, Harry. I, I'm sorry I, if I get a little animated. But I, I look at this and it, it's just unbelievable to me, you know. I, I guess there's one other thing to, to point out as well um, in regards to the buffer zone that we do currently have and that we are proposing to increase is the fact that we are separated by this vertical wall. Um, so this vertical wall does actually prohibit the lawn growing into the buffer area it stops people who sometimes when it's just a lawn rolling down to a buffer area from encroaching. We have a physical um, wall that is there and that's going to prevent that. So it's going to actually help maintain the buffer to thrive in its, the way it's been doing and really keep the house separate. So I, I think it's something that um, if the wall was not there the need for a larger buffer, you know, I, I could possibly understand that, but the, the ability to create a buffer that's then, you know, five, six, seven feet taller than the lower uh, buffer area, I, you know, I'll let other people speak, but I'm just not sure that would be as effective as if it was all, all one area. You know, and the, the last thing I'd like to say is that, you know, I've spent 40 years doing wetland restorations, probably one of the first people on Long Island, you know, and do I know the value of buffers and wetland vegetation? Absolutely. And we've done it all over Long Island, New York City, Westchester. And you know what? I live in Southampton and I truly care about 
uh, Mecox Bay and the rest of it. And uh, I have arguments with large property owners like to the South all the time. And I'll leave it at that, Harry. Uh, thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to speak in this application? May I have a word, Harry? Okay. Um, I just want to say that um, the property to the South was, I don't know how to get my hand down. There, I'll get it down. Uh, the property to the South was first developed in the 1960s. That's when the pool dates from. It's at a much higher elevation than the property we're dealing with. We're up at like 18 feet. Um, and it was developed uh, with this large house uh, many years ago. And the, the point is, you know, this is not a personal attack on, on Mr. Bowman. Um, it's not a personal you know, attack on, on, on the owner of the property. We, the science has improved, our knowledge has improved. And you know, we, we came in to say that uh, the board has the power and the discretion to make this a better application. And um, we support it with science. We know more now today. Um, and as you know, Frank Piccinini said years ago, we all thought global warming was something we deal with like in generations, but it's, it's happening now. You know, we've got invasive species. Uh, you, you know, it's an imminent danger right now. So the idea that we can do, I, I, I don't think uh, that you can cast stones because a neighbor who has a big house, you know, said, use the science to make that application as good as possible. Nobody came in to say, don't build the house here. Um, you shouldn't do anything here. We're just saying, um, this is a maximum build plan, despite, you know, what, uh, despite the talk about the buffer, it's a very small uh, uh, offer from the applicant to increase that buffer, very small. And, and the, the house is growing enormously. And Mr. Bowman said, I made inaccurate statements about the square footage. I did not. His, architecture, his architect just confirmed what I said. It's 8,900 square feet. It's built out absolutely as far as it can in the front, as far within six inches of where they have to stop building in the back. And he's asked for relief on the sides. And he wants to keep a lawn that needs, you know, herbicides, fungicides, and pesticides and treatments to, to keep it going. It doesn't make any sense. And the board has the, this, and this has been designated as a high priority water quality improvement zone. And you know, Dr. Gobler, who's speaking as a consultant, is telling you, you know, if, if you impact Hayground Cove, it, it and you kill off those oysters, you're going to kill off oyster farming in Meacox Bay, the, to the extent that you overload Hayground Cove with nitrates and phosphorus, you are threatening endangered and threatened habitats of species that thrive in in that. Uh, salt water, uh, fresh water mix that, Me that Mecox Bay is. So what we're saying, it's not hypocritical. Um, it's what we're saying is do the best you can. Use, use the authority you have to make this a better application. They could extend this wetland. They don't need a lawn in the back. You know, th that it would do better if that was entirely a rain garden. Um, and the idea that, that a, a, a short retaining wall is stopping the interaction between that lawn and what's above it and the water is, is re, it, it's, not, it's not true. <laughs> it's not plausible, okay? The, there is a hydrogeologic connection between the upland and the cove and consequently to me, Cox Bay. The fact that they built up a retaining wall doesn't stop that. And what we're, we're we didn't come in with guns blazing saying, no, you know, it's ridiculous. It's, you know, tear it down. Don't put anything here. We just came in and said, look, please make the applicant show a little more restraint. Restrain the building. Right now, when you look at that, the par portion of the land that's occupied by structure, it is occupied lot line to setback line with relief on the sides. 
it's a ma- it's it built out to the max. And what we're saying is, given the location and given what Dr. Gobler is saying, and given the function, the really good functions that wet wetlands, including freshwater wetlands, uh, provide to absorb storm storm surge, to keep your water your groundwater clean, to prevent runoff that's going to contaminate Neecox Bay, give it a chance to work. Make, make the features on this site as important as the building on this site. And you can do it easily. Uh, you know, maybe he doesn't need, I don't know how many bedrooms there are, but I accurately said it's 8,900 square feet. Maybe, maybe if he pulled it in on the sides and pulled it in a little bit on the back, maybe shrinking of you know a large swimming pool for this for this site 16 by 40 is pretty big here it's a very constrained site and and really came in with a planting plan for a rain garden then you know then you could say we really did our best we we know we know we're going to give them a house but we really did something to to re, to restore and enhance the functionality of both the tidal wetland and what could be a really dramatically increased freshwater Ooh. wetland. And I want to say one last thing. I don't want to uh, try your patience here, but you know, I, I was on the site looking out the window over this property when I went to examine what was going on. And as I looked for the first time in my life, Ooh. I saw a bald eagle totally do like a takeoff right, right in front of me. A bald eagle just went by. I've never seen it before. Um, and you know, well, I, I Jeff, say, you should you should hang around with me more often. You'd see bald eagles all well, the time. Maybe <laughs> maybe, that, I, that, that, I, maybe that, I spend too much time in the office. You know, but, that's for sure. You got to get out of the office. Jack, can I just can I just finish, Maybe please, deal. without being interrupted? Okay, that was important to me when I saw it. It meant mm-hmm. something to me, and it was an indication of what Meacox Bay is and can be. And mm-hmm. I'm asking the board. To, to make the make the applicant do a little more homework homework and exercise a little bit of restraint so that we enhance the wetland functionality and do something that makes it better. And and if you don't mind, Harry, my last comment, and then I'll be quiet. Um, certainly, the uh, the uh, Mr. Bragman is representing somebody who certainly has. Um, assets, and I have seen no voluntary uh, requirement of like putting in an AI system, which I have actually lots of clients who have voluntarily do that because they do actually have real concerns with water bodies, you know, and planting of buffers and get rid of their lawns and putting in different plants that we do all the time. And I have seen no, I'd feel much better if Mr. Bragman came in and said, hey, listen, my neighbor to the south, you know, he knows that he's he's despoiling Meacox Bay with with his house, his sanitary system, his pool, no buffers and lawns. And, you know, hey, uh, let's reconsider the application to the north, you know, but I'm willing to do this as well. I have not heard one single word for that. And that bothers me. And at that, that will be the end of my presentation. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this application? Yes, Peter. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. I'm the uh, I'm the builder on the property. I work with Chuck and Craig, and I just want to uh, say thank you to everyone. I appreciate all you do here. I'll keep this super short. Um, this is educational to me. It's it's pretty amazing. I hold a respect for Meacox Bay and everything all of you do. Um, the thing that seems incongruent to me is that uh, Jeff and the other guys that spoke uh, along with him seem to be talking about the environment, depth to groundwater, but yet they just want to shrink a, the house from the north and the south, which doesn't impact that at all. You're still going to have a, a septic system with the same distance to groundwater. This is the shallowest one actually made. Um and um, Marty um, worked with us on establishing this. And also, I'm not sure Jeff is aware of this, but this is the third time we've revised this. You know, we've worked with Marty for quite a while on this. And um, we really did, you know, get to a point where 
he was happy with where we got to on it. We did everything he asked. Um, so I just wanted everybody to know that. And again, I don't think the ask of Jeff Bragman is congruent with anything he's presenting is, is what I'm seeing from here. Um, you guys are the experts. I just want to thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to speak? Yeah, if I could uh, just offer uh, some brief uh, comments. Uh, in light of uh, the water quality issues that we're all uh, aware of, uh, there may, I don't want to speak for the applicant, but there may be an opportunity for my office to work with the applicant on a, a landscape plan, a landward of the intended covenanted buffer that um, devotes uh, some of that lawn area to uh, native uh, vegetation, thereby reducing the potential impact in terms of uh, fertilizer, and fertilizer and pesticides. Um, any reduction in that uh, lawn area can be beneficial. Uh, there may be some interest on part of the applicant maybe to create a native vegetation strip uh, immediately uh, landward of that existing uh, retaining wall. Um, so if uh, the applicant is so, in is so interested, I'd be happy to work with them to uh, try and uh, develop a, a landscape plan for this property that is less impacting in terms of fertilizers and pesticides. Thank you. And uh, that, that can be done, Harry. You know, no problem. Marty and I work on this kind of things all the time. We okay. can substitute Great. turf grasses that are there with non-fertilization grasses, <clears throat> shaded shrubs, all, all of that. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to speak in this application? No one else. Thank you. I just want to wrap it up and get to the next step. Uh, we've heard a lot of testimony. Uh, thank you all for participating. That's why we're here. Uh, so uh, just to sum up, uh, generalize, uh, let's say, uh, an hour and a half of testimony, I guess, in, in, about, uh, in about one or two minutes. Uh, what we heard is uh, we heard that uh, Meekox Bay has too much nitrogen and it's sensitive and and this is one lot that is contributing. Uh, we don't have quantifiers about how much compared to all the rest, uh, but it's one lot that we're looking at right now. Uh, the code gives us standards. We've looked at those standards. We've met all those standards except for one, and that is the buffer. There are two primary ways that Meekox Bay is, uh, is, is uh, going to be uh, getting gotten clean and kept clean. And uh, one is the, the technology, the new technology, the AI system of which this is uh, participating. And the other is the flushing of the Mecox Bay through opening of the inlet. Uh, the last couple of years, the last few years, the last five years, I would say, the management of the inlet has, has changed. Uh, for 300 years, it was dug whenever it got high and was flushed regularly. Then lately, the DEC has uh, offered some resistance on that. Uh, probably this board should encourage digging the inlet more often and getting more flushing action because that's the fastest way of cleaning up Beacox Bay. Uh, it may not be the best way for long term, but the AI system goes a long ways towards that. Uh, so those are the big pictures. Those are the big things that are going to make a big difference, noticeable and measurable in the uh, nitrogen of Beacox Bay. Uh, so uh, I would like to see uh, both of those things happening uh, as much as possible, uh, more IA systems and more flushing of the bay. Uh, so now on this particular lot, uh, the setbacks are met. I know Jeff, you wanted to pick away at a few things on the edges. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, that's fine to say, but I don't think it has much impact. Uh, I think the builder spoke wisely on that. That uh, really misses misses the bullseye. Uh, but uh, Marty uh, suggested something very valuable, and that is that uh, <clears throat> the one area, the one part of this project that is deficient on uh, meeting the, the recommended setback, recommended uh, standards uh, is that buffer. It's short about uh, 15 feet, probably uh, uh, not probably the 15 feet of the whole distance because it does vary. But the fact that the applicant agrees with Marty to uh, work on a plan to reduce the 
uh, nitrogen application on that lawn area is the one thing that we could do to make this a better project, a noticeably better project. So I commend uh, both Marty and the applicant, uh, Chuck, for that. Uh, and I just wanna just put a little uh, edges on that. Uh, I'd like to see uh, you guys work on a, uh, on a plan that uh, will create essentially a pseudo buffer. I say that because it may not be covenanted, but you can put plantings in there that will achieve a rec the recommended buffer of 75 feet uh, as a minimum. More is better. But if you can strive to achieve 75 feet, uh, the goal here, uh, what I see, and I've seen a lot of these applications, what I see is that we have to, we have to look at the legal part of the code and meet that recommended setback and recommended buffer. But what we really wanna do is reduce the nitrogen application on the lawn and it's the buffering process and covenanting that achieves that. So if we can somehow uh, think of ways to reduce or eliminate, uh, with the emphasis on eliminate, nitrogen application on that property altogether, that would be a huge win. Uh, so with that, um, we do not need to leave the public hearing open for uh, working out that additional area for nitrogen reduction in the lawn behind the wall. Um, Chuck and Marty, you guys are seasoned. You know what needs to be done, and you can yes. work that together. Uh, well, so, you know, I, I just have a point of order here. Are you making the decision for the board? Is there going to be board discussion uh, on this? I mean, or do, have you decided that it meets all standards? I mean, isn't that a board decision, or is that just your opinion? Yeah, we've we finished hearing from the public. I just want to object to that statement that it meets all standards. The setbacks are minimums. They're, they're well, not maybe all the standard. I said we have finished from hearing from the public. I apologize. I sometimes can't restrain myself. Noted. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor? Harry, I Ann. I. Tom. Tom R. Tom F. You're muted. Hi. George. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you all for participating. Thank you for making uh, a better decision. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat>
at this point. Um, the uh, report uh, stresses uh, the need to uh, protect the uh, and or minimize uh, impacts to the uh, steep slopes at the site. Um, it uh, indicates that uh, some uh, refinements are needed to uh, show the uh, true extent of uh, potential uh, site uh, disturbance that would occur as a uh, result of this uh, subdivision plan. Um, it recommends that a uh, common uh, drive easement uh, be uh, considered as a way of uh, minimizing impacts to uh, subdivision uh, to uh, steep slopes. Um, the uh, planning board is working with the trails advisory board uh, to look at uh, which existing uh, trails should be uh, abandoned, uh, preserved, and or rerouted. So uh, the comments indicate that the uh, final uh, recommended uh, trail uh, network needs to be uh, shown on the uh, final uh, subdivision uh, plat. And um, in the uh, western portion of the uh, track, there is an encroaching uh, driveway to a uh, private uh, home which is somewhat uh, difficult to see on this uh, map. It's actually in the open space uh, portion to the uh, west of this uh, lot. So the advisory uh, report uh, recommends that uh, that existing uh, driveway be uh, relocated off of this track. What uh, you're not seeing on the uh, plan in front of you um, Karina, if you uh, pan out a little bit more, a uh, significant uh, portion of this uh, track to the uh, west um, and to the north would be uh, preserved as uh, open space. Thank you. Motion to send those comments to the planning board. Second. All in favor, Harry, I and? I. Tom R. Tom F. Aye. George? Aye. Thank you. The next is the ZBA 808 Meacox Road, LLC. This is an application that is located directly across the street from where I live, and therefore I'm going to recuse myself. Uh, Charles, how do I do that? Do Let's I turn push? the video off? Just turn the video off. Okay. I'll, I'll do it. Okay, you can proceed. All right. Um, this um, this is a uh, pending uh, variance application before the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals uh, for, as uh, indicated, a uh, property that's on the redevelopment on Meacox Road in Bridgehampton. The um, recommended advisory uh, comments uh, do acknowledge uh, the location of this uh, property within uh, close proximity of the uh, headwaters and uh, associated uh, wetlands of Swan Creek. However, uh, the comments do indicate that this property uh, uh, actually uh, lies uh, beyond the uh, town's wetland uh, permitting uh, jurisdiction. Um, the, um, the uh, plans that uh, you see um, do call for additional improvements beyond those which we had issued a letter of non-jurisdiction for. Uh, nonetheless, um, uh, those improvements, namely the uh, tennis court, uh, would also be uh, outside of the uh, 200 uh, foot uh, setback from the uh, nearest uh, wetland. So, um, you know, uh, aside from that, um, as is uh, customary for these uh, reports, um, the advisory uh, comments indicate that uh, we have uh, not considered the uh, set, uh, variance criteria that are set forth in the town building and zoning code.
Do I have a motion? Move motion ten. to send these comments. Second. All in favor? Ann? Aye. Tom R. Tom F. Aye. Bless you, Tom. God bless you. Thank you. And myself, I. Uh, next advisory is Alice Greenwall. And I guess yeah, we can Harry back. Am I back? I guess I'm back. Okay. Yeah. This is a uh, pending uh, variance application for a residentially developed property on Hmere Drive in the uh, Hamlet or North Sea. The comments are brief. Um, they indicate that the property is within the uh, jurisdiction of town regulated uh, freshwater wetlands. Uh, the uh, report goes on, however, to uh, provide some history. It indicates that uh, some of the improvements that were uh, completed and permitted by the uh, building uh, division at this uh, property um, were uh, undertaken prior uh, to my office being aware of the uh, presence of uh, freshwater wetlands within uh, 200 uh, feet. Once we did uh, become aware of the uh, approximate uh, wetlands, we did uh, require uh, a, a wetland uh, permit for uh, additional uh, improvements. Uh, so the uh, comments are just noting the uh, property's uh, proximity uh, to wetlands uh, are not raising uh, significant uh, issues with uh, regards to the improvements for which uh, variants are being sought. Thank you. Motion to send those comments to the ZBA. Second. All in favor, Harry I. Ann? Aye. Tom R? Aye. Tom F? Aye. George? Aye. The administrative wetland permits are in your packets. <clears throat> Resolution of conditional approval, A021003, Joshua Field and Paula Field. Any discussion? Motion to approve. Second. Resolved that a conditional wetland permit approval will be granted to Joshua Field and Paula Field for the proposed project about the terms and conditions set forth therein. All in favor, Harry, aye, and? Aye. Tom R? Aye. Tom F? Aye. George? Aye. A021012, Harvey Ross. Any discussion? Moved to issue. Second. Resolved that a conditional wetland permit approval be granted to Harvey Ross for the proposed project about the terms and conditions set forth therein. All in favor? Harry, aye. Ann? Aye. Tom R? Aye. Tom F? Aye. George? Aye. A021015-172 MP Road, LLC. Any discussion? Move to issue. Second. Resolve that a conditional wetland approval approval be granted to 172 MP Road, LLC, for the proposed project for the terms and conditions set forth therein. All in favor? Harry, aye. Ann? Aye. Tom R? Aye. Tom F? Aye. George? Aye. A021092, the Dominique Levy Gift Trust. Any discussion? Move to issue. Second. Resolved that a conditional wetland approval will be granted to the Dominique Levy Gift Trust for the proposed project by the terms and conditions set forth therein. All in favor? Harry, aye. Ann? Aye. Tom R? Aye. Tom F? Aye. George? Aye. And next is the decision A021034, Martin Bridgefingal and Juliet Jalima. And Kelly, you need to recuse yourself. And is Jim nearby? Jim is not available tonight. Uh, it was my understanding that there was a letter sent in to adjourn this. I don't know if anyone received that or email. 
One moment, please. I think uh, perhaps uh, Karina had uh, received that late. And let me just afternoon. check for the exact date that they requested. It were February 9th. Okay. The next meeting. So, um, <clears throat> is there a motion to adjourn this decision till the next meeting? Yeah, that would actually be a postponement of the decision since the hearing is closed. Okay. It would be a postponement of any action on the application until uh, February 9th. Motion to postpone yeah. action until February 9th. Second. Okay. All in favor, Harry, aye, Ann? Aye. Tom R. Aye. Tom F. Aye. George? Aye. Now, preliminary review secret determination A021040 213 Shore Road, LLC. Uh, this is an application that's been uh, filed in order to uh, redevelop a um, residential a lot that has uh, frontage on uh, North Sea Creek and the uh, Hamlet or North Sea. Um, the um, new uh, residence would be built uh, essentially in the uh, same uh, footprint as the existing house and a detached garage. Um, a uh, IAOWTS would be installed. Um, the applicant had uh, proposed a uh, 20 uh, foot uh, buffer. There is a minor rock rebetment along the uh, shoreline. Um, I have asked that that uh, covenant to buffer be uh, maximized so that it's extended to within uh, five feet of the uh, residence. Uh, the applicant is not adverse to that. So, um, this is a uh, small lot um, that's about the uh, best you can uh, do with this uh, property because of its uh, constraints. Um, we do have uh, sufficient information to make a determination. As such, I am recommending that the hearing requirement be waived. Motion to waive the public hearing. Second. Resolved that the Town Conservation Board hereby waives the public hearing requirement pursuant to Chapter 325, Section 325-80 80 of the Town Code. All in favor? Harry, I am. I. Tom. Tom R. I. Tom F. I. George. I. A022004, Jeffrey Digg. Uh, this application relates to a residentially developed property on Noyak Harbor uh, Road. Um, in the uh, hamlet of uh, Noyak, the uh, property as indicated has uh, fronted on the uh, surface waters and tidal uh, wetlands of uh, Noyak Creek. Um, the um, board had issued a uh, permit uh, some years ago in order to allow for uh, various uh, residential additions and other improvements um, with demolition and reconstruction of the existing home. Uh, that uh, permit was conditioned upon the establishment of a covenanted nationally vegetated buffer, um, the full scope of which is actually not shown on this uh, survey. Um, the, um, the applicant had let their uh, permit expire and then they also made some minor uh, changes to the uh, entrance and the uh, driveway. Um, they had only recently commenced the uh, required uh, revegetation of the uh, buffer. Um, I uh, went out to the uh, property and found um, that uh, the overwhelming uh, majority of the construction is consistent with what the board had approved and the uh, minimal uh, changes are not gonna result in any uh, new 
wetland uh, impacts. However, uh, there is a need for uh, supplemental uh, native uh, revegetation within the uh, required buffer. Um, I've also asked the Afghan to get the extent of buffer uh, corrected on the uh, survey. Um, the Afghan is uh, amenable uh, to that uh, request. So um, we uh, have uh, sufficient information uh, to uh, waive uh, the hearing so that uh, we can go forward at the uh, following meeting with the conditional approval to uh, reauthorize uh, essentially the activities that were previously approved in order to allow the landowner to finish the buffer reclamation uh, close out the uh, permit and file for a certificate of wetland compliance. Motion to waive the public hearing. Second. Resolved that the Town Conservation Board hereby waives the public hearing requirement pursuant to Chapter 325, Section 325-80 of the Town Code. All in favor, Harry, aye, and? Aye. Tom R. Aye. Tom F. Aye. George. Aye. Resolution to schedule public hearing, CB 20013, MIR Noyak Realty, LLC. This is a uh, pending uh, modification application where it recently came to our attention that uh, the pro property is encumbered by a shared access easement um, that <laughs> was not shared with us uh, by the applicant when the board had issued the original uh, permit. Um, the uh, council for the abutting uh, property owner has uh, requested that a uh, hearing be scheduled on this application to allow for a uh, full uh, disclosure of any easements or encumbrances uh, on this uh, Property. So this is a uh, resolution to uh, schedule here. Do we have a date, Marty? March 9th. Motion scheduled public hearing from March 9th, 2022. Second. Resolved that the Town Conservation Board hereby schedules the public hearing from March 9th, 2022, and the notice of public hearing be published in the town designated newspaper pursuant to Chapter 325, Section 325-8C of the Town Code. All in favor? Harry, I and I. Tom R. I. Tom. I. George. I. That concludes our regular agenda. We need to go to executive session, and that's going to be a dial into town hall. Does everybody have the numbers to dial into and the access code? No. Yeah. Um, I would just offer that as there is no uh, further uh, business, you should probably vote to adjourn uh, the meeting. And yes. I only anticipate that there will be a need to go back into the regular meeting after the uh, executive session. Uh, yes. Um, uh, so let's Can see. In the chat, I put the uh, dial in number, the extension, and access code. Anyone who doesn't have it, you can write it down. Could you put that up there again, please, Kelly? Uh, yeah, can you open the chat? There's I've like got to write it down. So this meeting will be adjourned, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, in one moment. Okay. I need to get a vote for that. 2836,000, what extension, Kelly? <laughs> 7100. 100. Thank you, Tom. And do you have the access code? Yeah, it's on the chat. What was the access code? Three one five five. Yeah, there's nobody on, five, so you can talk. You, yeah. Okay. You hear that? Three one five eight five nine five. Everybody, good on that now. Yep. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, Harry, aye, and? Aye. Tom R? Aye. Tom F? Aye. George? Aye. 